I should have you know, had an interesting costume or something. Because <laughs> I see a lot of people. It's like red movies, so it's not really Not really that exciting. Um, uh, the topic is the Emancipation Proclamation, which I think most people probably have kind of a ballpark idea about what that is. Um, but as with many things, it's more complicated <laughs> than uh, what people imagine. Uh, I actually didn't write uh, the text here on this thing, but it says uh, events leading up to emancipation. So actually, I'm covering that. How did the emancipation contribute to the morale and unity of this great nation? That depends on what we're talking about. Uh, it, was, it certainly created disunity at the time. There was great controversy and great acrimony and, uh, and uh, conflict concerning emancipation. So uh, it did not contribute to unity. Uh, you could argue that you know, ultimately racial equality creates unity. It just takes you know, another 160 years to have the job maybe done. If you watch the news, maybe it was no way to go on that one. But uh, uh, I thought it was kind of an interesting uh, question about morale and unity. Uh, the morale factor actually I'll get into because there were great fears that emancipation would damage morale in the middle of a war. That this is, a, this is actually a liability to winning the Civil War. Um, and then what was, it, what was it within Lincoln's presidential powers to issue it, the legality question? And that's an interesting one too. Um, uh, and people have argued that kind of, uh, uh, since the time of it being issued, uh, that's been under contention. Was Lincoln basically violating the Constitution in multiple ways? Did he have the power as, um, as president, commander in chief to do that? <coughs> um, uh, Lincoln's kind of a pragmatist. I'd say that uh, he would say, well, I did it. <laughs> Lincoln does other things that technically he's not supposed to be able to do either. And uh, so that question, you know, you can, you can go back and forth with whether really the legality question matters so much. Lincoln would have said that if the North doesn't win the Civil War and the country falls apart, it won't matter what he did. Because <laughs> he'll probably be in exile somewhere and uh, the United States will no longer exist. So Lincoln, I think, looked at it in terms of the dire consequences of um, uh, the war going the wrong way, the Union being destroyed, and what would follow. <clears throat> and then finally, how did it affect the civil rights movement? And uh, you know, fundamentally, without emancipation, there is no civil rights movement. I mean, you have to get past slavery. Um, what Lincoln does is part of um, a whole series of events that lead us toward the end of slavery. He's not the only one who's taking action. In some cases, the president is actually acting in opposition to some people who are taking actions that he thinks are ill-timed or not really thought out. Lincoln is a lawyer, and actually Lincoln uh, argues both sides of these questions himself. And so we, we have contradictory documents that Lincoln himself draped, which he seems to say the opposite <laughs> uh, positions of ultimately the one that he takes. And I think that you know, as a practitioner of law, Lincoln was accustomed to you know, arguing around all sides of a problem and, and then finally, sort of taking a pragmatic position. <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure Lincoln really believed in the absolute correctness or truth of much of anything. I mean, you, you know, reality is too complicated in, in many circumstances to say with absolute certainty about things. He could make a good argument, though. Um, so, there's no clicker, so I'm going to have to go over here and do this manually, but it works. Um, First of all, Emancipation Proclamation, um, if you ask, typically ask for students, uh, what is it? They'll say, you know, Lincoln freed the slaves. And that's true, but uh, the Emancipation Proclamation occurs in a couple of stages. Um, first, in September of 1862, the president announced he was going to free slaves at, at the beginning of the following year, or the next year, um, if the, the, the states in, a, in, a, in rebellion did not rejoin the Union stop fighting against the government. So initially in September of 62, nobody gets emancipated. It's like in the future, uh, next January, I'm going to do it. Um, then if you look at some of these newspaper articles, you'll see um, this is from January 1st, uh, Emancipation Proclamation, all the slaves in rebellious states declare free. So in rebellious states, not in other ones. Um, also, Tennessee and portions of Virginia and Louisiana accepted that's because Union troops occupied those areas at that time, so they're not technically in rebellion. <laughs> so not everyone is going to be affected by the Emancipation Proclamation. Only states and areas in rebellion. 
And keep in mind, those are the areas that the federal government does not control. So no one's going to get free immediately at all from this. <laughs> so um, uh, a lot of people, I don't think they, 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 they understand that uh, Lincoln's measure doesn't free anybody immediately. <laughs> um, uh, and interestingly enough, in, you know, in the border states, uh, uh, you know, where you have loyalists, people who are on the side of the Union, some of whom are slaveholders, uh, many of them continue to own their slaves all the way until the end of the war. And, uh, uh, for example, uh, Ulysses S. Grant's wife, Julia, owned a slave as a personal servant. And so throughout the Civil War, Julia Grant owned the slave who continued to be enslaved while her husband fought for the Union and ultimately won the war. And by contrast, uh, uh, General Robert Lee of Virginia didn't believe in slavery and uh, opposed the institution when he inherited some slaves through his wife's family. He, he moved to basically uh, um, emancipate them or divest himself of them. And so you have this weird sort of contrast of uh, um, you know, people on the northern side who are pro-slavery, some of whom own slaves, people on the southern side who are actually anti-slavery, but for different reasons, for you know, their affections and loyalties to their home state, they wind up fighting for the Confederacy. So uh, all that makes the Civil War a little bit more complicated than, than people imagine, and more interesting, too. And then, of course, you have the families that divide up, where some brothers are on one side and uh, other brothers in the family are on other sides. I just put this up here because uh, I think these documents are cool. Um, there's like sort of like the official, what, what I guess is the official copy of the Emancipation Proclamation, which is, is written in very beautiful letters or, or beautiful penmanship. That was probably done by uh, um, a professional calligrapher or uh, Lincoln had two ser not servants. We're talking about slavery. Um, after a long day of teaching, your brain starts turning to mush uh, incredibly, and your feet start hurting. Um, uh, Lincoln has two secretaries, and both of them write a lot of the documents that ultimately he signed. So it's not that Lincoln didn't, you know, uh, uh, claim the, the nice. This is in his handwriting, and you can see him striking things out. Uh, Lincoln didn't just wake up one morning and decide to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. This is something that had been in gestation for a long time. He's, he had worked on the text for a long time, literally walking around with the copy in his pocket, apparently, or in his hat. He used to store documents in his hat when he was a lawyer. Um, so Lincoln's being very strategic about uh, the timing, exactly what he wants to do, the limits and, and uh, of, of exactly what his policy is going to uh, involved. Uh, we should also say that uh, uh, Lincoln is not a radical when it comes to slavery and ending slavery. I think a lot of my, my students will say, well, what's Lincoln's position on slavery or race? Lincoln is an enemy of slavery and they became president. We fought the Civil War to end slavery. It's like, no. Um, Lincoln is a moderate, meaning that uh, he doesn't like slavery uh, since, you know, early adulthood. He had come to the realization that he didn't like slavery. He had traveled to the South and seen slavery and didn't like it. Lincoln certainly against the spread of slavery. Um, <clears throat> but even during his lifetime, people misread his words. And uh, for example, the, the, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, uh, Lincoln gives his famous house divided speech. He says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Um, people interpret that as being he wants to end slavery. No, he's saying that at, in that speech that uh, the United States will become all one thing or all the other. In other words, slavery abolished or slavery ever, that it can't, can't continue to exist in this, this balancing act. And so um, Lincoln becomes president in his inaugural address, his first inaugural. He makes it crystal clear you know, that the South is already seceding, there were even state conventions, Lincoln says, that to Southerners, you know, um, that I'm not out to get you. I have no intention of ending slavery at this time. The Constitution protects slavery, and I've just taken the, the vow to defend and protect the Constitution. You know, I'm not your enemy. The South doesn't believe it. <laughs> but um, Lincoln takes actions again and again that shows his moderation. And a lot of that, quite frankly, it's not about the morality of slavery. It's about politics and about winning the war. And doing this in a way um, that uh, won't do more harm than good to the primary objective, which is, is preserving the Union and winning the Civil War. And so um, uh, there are already um, other players on the battlefield, basically. Um, <coughs> Lincoln makes his statement in his inaugural address 
And like three weeks later, two senators, John Crittenden and Andrew Johnson, um, they make a, a, a resolution on the Senate floor that's ratified by the U.S. Senate. <laughs> and it, it kind of paraphrases Lincoln's wording. It says, the war is not for overthrowing or interfering with, quote, established institutions. They're saying slavery. So early in the Civil War, many Union leaders noticed that Johnson's a Tennessean. He saw it through the Union during the Civil War, and that's why he becomes vice president and then president. Johnson uh, came from a humble background in North Carolina, uh, really from sort of the bottom of Southern society. And he worked his way up to being a successful lawyer in Tennessee. And Johnson hates the slaveholding South because they rejected him. Then after he becomes president, he kind of changes his mind a little bit about that, starts liking that. But these two men, they come from border states, and uh, their constituencies are worried about tinkering around with slavery. They want to make it clear that that's not what the war is about. Um, even though Lincoln himself says this, he's not so happy about this uh, Senate resolution because of the effect that it has in Europe. Um, in Europe, many people who had themselves assumed that the war is about slavery, when they, when they see this and see it being passed by Congress, um, they say, well, you know, then it's not really a moral issue. We're free not to side with the Union. <laughs> and maybe we can side with the South because slavery is not really on the table. And so this kind of actually creates a door, a way out for uh, people in Europe who would like to see the United States break apart, and, but they're worried about slavery because they know that many Europeans um, uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't countenance supporting uh, the South in the Civil War if slavery is on the table. Um, the Secretary of War, Simon Cameron, um, those guys are basically border states. Kentucky, Tennessee, those were slave states. Um, Cameron uh, is a Yankee, I believe, from Pennsylvania. And um, as Secretary of War, he delivers a report to Congress at the end of 1861. And uh, kind of written into this report, he says, and as Secretary of War, I authorize the freeing and arming of slaves that cross over union lines. You know, in other words, we're not going to actively go and try to free slaves across the South, per se, but if um, slaves encounter the Union armies where fighting is occurring, we will free them and arm them and put them to work fighting for the Union. Um, Lincoln immediately reacts to this by rescinding those words, saying, no, you don't. Um, and again, it's not that Lincoln likes slavery. It's that he sees this um, as political dynamite. Uh, Lincoln has to hold together the North, including diverse groups, including people in the border states. And um, the other thing I think is that uh, Lincoln questioned whether a Secretary of War had the power to do this. And the lawyer kicks in. It's like, wait a minute. Um, uh, is this legal? I'm not sure. We better not, not go there yet. Um, but these kinds of things do raise a question of, um, uh, part of me wonders if Lincoln is president and he's afraid I'm going to ultimately take action. I don't want other people stealing my thunder in a way. It's like, wait a minute, you know, I'm being deliberative and other people are running around me and trying to, to you know, advance the cause of emancipation before I'm ready, before I think it's prudent. Congress uh, passes confiscation acts, first in 1861 and then a year later. And uh, these specify that southern slaves can be confiscated um, and that the return of escaped slaves is now made illegal. In other words, there have been, I guess, some union officers who are, in effect, pro-slavery, who, who said basically, if slaves escape the Union Army, I'm going to turn around and return them right back to their owners again. But we don't want these people. Uh, there, there's not a unified opinion among uh, northern commanders about what to do about slaves. Some of them are actually not at all sympathetic of, of the plight of these people. It's like they're in the way. They're, you know, they're, they're gumming up the works. Um, you know, I'm trying to run a war, and these people are showing up with their children and non-combatants. They're not really an asset. Therefore, um, Congress attempts to step in. And keep in mind that Congress, at this point in time, is primarily, uh, primarily uh, composed of Northerners, <laughs> because the South, of course, has left. And so uh, uh, the, the opinion of members of Congress is going to go, uh, I think, more and more toward supporting the end of slavery you already have some called radical Republicans who are, who are there. Um, first in Virginia, then down in Louisiana, more infamously or famously, depending on your point of view, 
Ben Butler is a major general in the Union armies. He's the man who occupies the city of New Orleans after Union gunboats uh, run past the blockading forts, capture the city. New Orleans is the biggest port in the South. It's a major blow to the Confederacy when it falls. Um, and uh, Butler, among other things, is accused of stealing silverware from you know Southerners. They call him Silverware Butler. Also, uh, <coughs> Union ladies were insulting Union soldiers, sometimes like you know, cat calls, spitting on them or whatever. Butler said, anyone who does that shows disrespect to the flag or to Union troops in uniform. These women will be arrested and treated like ladies of the town. So he's very unpopular. <laughs> Um, he, he, he ultimately leaves the military, goes back to Massachusetts, and serves in the United States Senate. He's a member of Congress, um, and he's a so-called radical Republican. So he's someone who believes slavery is evil, needs to be abolished right now. And so when he, he uh, arrives in New Orleans in southern Louisiana, um, he simply begins uh, uh, freeing slaves as so-called contraband of war. He says that you know, their property, right? Well, I'm seizing bales of cotton, I'm seizing other property. If it's just property, like you say, in the South, then these are, this is a valuable property being used for the Southern cause. I'm seizing it. And this creates consternation, um, it, not just in the South, but back North. They feel like, wait a minute, uh, uh, is this legal for a general to do this? Generally, Lincoln, as commander-in-chief at this point in time, frowns upon this. It's like, um, you know, cut it out. Um, Butler, though, is a politically powerful person, so Lincoln doesn't want to tangle with him so much. These two other Union commanders kind of do the same thing. John C. Fremont is in Missouri, so not that far from where we're at. Fremont uh, um, is basically anti-slavery. He begins um, freeing slaves and uh, issues a proclamation. Um, Lincoln basically quells the pro proclamation and then reassigns him, <laughs> so uh, he loses his job over it. David Hunter is down in like uh, South Carolina, Florida, in the southeast. He does the same thing, starts freeing slaves. And again, um, Lincoln is trying to tread lightly on this issue at this point in time. He's not sure what he wants to do. He knows he wants to get reelected. <laughs> and this is, you're, you're, you're playing with dynamite. Uh, and so Lincoln basically steps in and says, you know, uh, I'm not sure this is legal. I'm, I'm, I'm not counting it. Stop what you're doing or else. So, you know, the imagery of Lincoln is a great emancipator at this point in time. Lincoln is the stop emancipation, it's all ready for it. He's, he's kind of playing a, the role of putting the brakes on, not the other way. Um, <laughs> Lincoln famously has a meeting with, with five African American leaders in August of 1862. Um, and he talks to them, he urges them to consider emigration to Africa. So, Lincoln is now, you know, he wants to end slavery, but he's not sure that he wants millions of African Americans living in the United States. And many of his, you know, many people across the United States, many white Americans are sort of in the same place at that point in time. So Lincoln has this chat. He's like, you ever think about leaving North America? And guess what? They're like, no. In fact, black leaders you know, across the North, including Frederick Douglass, roundly condemned this. They're like, you've got to be joking. And they would point out that, uh, um, First of all, African Americans already fought in the American Revolution, especially you know, soldiers from Rhode Island. In the War of 1812, there's lots of African Americans in the US Navy. So it's like, wait a minute, you know, uh, black people have bled for this country already. And, and it's our country, you know, where do you want us to go exactly? So Lincoln is he's looking for um, measures in which he can kind of finesse the issue. That turns out to be a non-starter. I mentioned radical Republicans, um, and again, like Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, these are, are Northeasterners. Um, these people are intensifying the pressure on Lincoln and letting him know, you've got to do something because you're not going to get reelected. Lincoln actually doesn't have a lot of support in the part of the United States that he's from. You know, Lincoln's born in Kentucky, and Kentucky is mostly voting for Northern Democrats. They're not, that's not Lincoln country, and Southern Illinois isn't either. I mean, so it's, it's interesting that many of Lincoln's own neighbors uh, are probably not going to vote for him for president. Um, and so these Northerners um, are uh, ratcheting up the political pressure, saying, saying to Lincoln, um, you know, we believe the Civil War should be about slavery. <laughs> that, uh, you know, kind of freedom is the ultimate cause, and you need to get on board somehow. So Lincoln is getting, you know, uh, he's getting pressure from the 
border states people, from the, the uh, anti-slavery abolitionist people, and uh, this creates acute discomfort. Um, in April of 63, Congress emancipates slaves in the District of Columbia. Um, they don't wait for Lincoln. <laughs> they free all slaves in the district. Now that's kind of curious because earlier in the, in the uh, Compromise of 1850, supposedly Congress had ended slavery in the District of Columbia back in 1850. So why are slaves back in Washington? I don't know. That doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, that was one of the, you know, California became a free state. Um, and, you know, uh, fugitive slave laws passed a number of these provisions. One of them was no more slave trade, and D.C. was supposed to be free soil. But obviously it doesn't stick somehow. So in April of 63, Congress uh, emancipates all slaves in D.C., and they actually paid the owners for them. So that's kind of, a, if you're a slave owner, you're going to lose your slaves pretty soon. It wasn't bad to be a Washington, D.C. slave owner because Congress authorized payment, and on average people received about $300 which 300 bucks in money back then, uh, there were a lot of average working people who didn't make $300 in a year. So this, that's a lot of money um, uh, in that time and, and place. So Congress is, is also ratcheting up the pressure. And so uh, Lincoln probably uh, realizes that I need to get a handle on this somehow because other people, other institutions, uh, they're getting the job done. Frederick Douglass is also putting pressure on Lincoln. Uh, Douglass uh, develops a rapport, I don't know if it's really a friendship with Lincoln, but uh, Douglass is basically uh, um, uh, uh, putting the pressure on Lincoln and telling him that, uh, <coughs> that the end of slavery is inevitable and that uh, you know, you're a good politician, you need to get in front of this thing. Um, or you're going to be on the wrong side of history. And I think Lincoln ultimately realized that uh, uh, politically this is very risky, it's dangerous, uh, it could backfire on me, but if I can figure a way um, to move the country toward ending slavery, as Lincoln himself put it, this will be like the, the one thing that I'm remembered for. So, so you know, I, I, I think of Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s. Johnson's from Texas, originally he was like pro-segregation, but he could, he could feel the wind blowing <laughs> in the 1960s. And Johnson realizes that you know, if I want to be a great president, I need to wrap myself around the Civil Rights Acts of 64 and 65. You know, and then I'll go down in history as great, that's really what Johnson wanted. But uh, you don't have to look very deep to find contradictory things earlier where Johnson's on the other side for political reasons. So Lincoln, uh, surely by, by 1863, he realizes that uh, um, for a number of reasons, the time is uh, approaching. Uh, I mentioned border states, you can see here in yellow, these are all slave states, Missouri and Kentucky, West, well, West, the western counties of Virginia become West Virginia, and then Maryland and Delaware. Um, and so uh, uh, Lincoln, uh, at one point in time, people talked about, uh, um, uh, you know, at the beginning of the Civil War, uh, winning the war, and, and so people talked about having God on his side, and, and Lincoln said, uh, um, now I'd like to have God on my side in the Civil War, but I have to have Kentucky. <laughs> that kind of this is vital. And so um, the border states always create this kind of tap dance of um, don't offend them. Uh, you know, if, if you make the wrong move, you could have, in all of those states, uh, uh, men are already fighting for the South. There are regiments from Kentucky, from Missouri, from Maryland, from Delaware in the Confederate armies. And so, um, you know, sort of the manpower flow is affected by people's political feelings and what's going on. And so uh, Lincoln probably would like to slow down the number of people from the border states that are actively supporting the South and maybe turn some of them around and put them in, in blue uniforms. And so, again, um, uh, that makes for a ticklish issue is, is the position of those border regions. In the North, you have pro-Southerners who are referred to as copperheads. This is a poster attacking Lincoln as a, as a king, Africanus the first. So there's a healthy dose of white supremacy and racism mixed in. And uh, uh, ordinary Northerners, including Lincoln himself, I think, sort of take for granted that uh, um, Caucasians, that white people are superior to black people. Uh, Lincoln, toward the end of his life, he had come a long distance in his views about race. And famously, uh, Lincoln began advocating the vote for 
those who fought in uniform for the North and the very intelligent, not anybody else. Um, so uh, for his time, Lincoln is progressive, but I think many people today look at Lincoln and they, they, they're kind of shocked that uh, you know, he doesn't think about this the way we do today. And, and of course, uh, you know, Lincoln's views on things evolve over time, and uh, he's moving in the right direction, but it takes time. Uh, the British are an important consideration. Um, England uh, is flirting with recognizing the Confederacy. England is building warships for the South, so-called blockade runners, and uh, it's almost like the submarines of World War I and World War II. The South is receiving funding and support, um, actually sailors, uh, like the, uh, the uh, what is it, CSS Alabama, um, is prowling the ocean looking for Union merchant vessels just like U-boats during you know, the Second World War, attacking them, sinking them, or capturing them. Well, who sails aboard the Alabama? The officers are Southerners, but a lot of the ordinary seamen are actually Brits and Scots. They're just soldiers for hire or sailors for hire. So in England, you have a split in opinion. Lower class Englishmen, a working people, are hostile towards slavery and tend to be sympathetic with the North. Aristocrats, the people who sit in Parliament, Guess who they admire? Southern gentlemen. They, they see the South as mirroring their view of kind of a feudal society, the way things used to be back in the good old days in Britain, where serfs were bent over in the dirt, and people like themselves, their ancestors, ran everything. And so there's this strong connection. Of course, Southern diplomats are in Britain constantly trying to uh, convince the, 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 the British government to officially recognize the Confederacy. And they come awfully close. It's, it's, a, it's a close call. <clears throat> um, what really is uh, preventing the British, I think, from recognizing the South, because we should point out the South is winning the war uh, back east for the first two and a half years. Um, Southern armies under Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, are really pounding uh, their northern opponents. And that makes it even more like the, the, the military realities you know, there you go. Uh, the military realities of uh, Lincoln's grand armies going out and getting uh, really circles fought around them by smaller southern armies, uh, that convinces many people in England that uh, uh, the Confederacy is going to become a reality <laughs> militarily. And uh, if you throw in the sympathizers, um, there, there's, there's a movement afoot to, to basically um, recognize the Confederacy, and then the next step is military support. And remember, you know, we think of England today, of Great Britain as like our number one ally in the world. Well, back up the, the clock to the 1860s, you know, uh, we fought the revolution eight years against them, then the War of 1812. Uh, most people in the United States saw Britain primarily as a, as a long-term adversary, I mean, uh, not as a friend. And so the South, of course, needs any friends it can get, it needs military supplies. And so uh, militarily, you know, Lincoln has his Emancipation Proclamation drafted, but he's waiting around and the fortunes of war are going rather poorly. Um, and so Lincoln really needs to wait until he has some good news as cover before he announces this thing. Or the, the, the thinking goes that around the world and in Europe, people are going to see it as one last cry of desperation before the Union loses the war. That uh, um, you know, people are going to see it as a desperation measure and uh, it's going to sort of take the uh, effect away that Lincoln hopes of uh, steering Europe away from supporting the South, saying that we are fighting for freedom, we are fighting to end slavery, um, and, uh, but still, you need some battlefield victories. Um, one person that Lincoln needs to look over his shoulder and worry about is George B. McClellan. He's the principal union commander of the Army of the Potomac. Um, and, uh, McClellan liked to pose as Napoleon Bonaparte with one hand tucked in his, his jacket like this. McClellan is, is the upper class son of a Philadelphia doctor. Um, he sees Abraham Lincoln as an uneducated redneck, uh, unqualified to be president. Uh, this guy has a huge ego. And uh, he's also, oddly enough, basically pro-slavery. Um, he's sympathetic with slavery. He does not believe in freeing slaves. He does not believe in racial equality. He's a Northern Democrat. He's not a member of the Republican Party. And so uh, Lincoln has as his top general a man who openly insults the President of the United States. At different points in time, Lincoln would come to see his general. And McClellan would leave him waiting down in, like the, you know, down in the lobby. It's like the general's going to bed. 
sorry, Mr. President, see you later when you feel like it. And so uh, the relationship was really bad. And uh, McClellan makes it clear that he believes that if Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation, that uh, Northern armies will lay down their arms. And he, he's acting like, well, and I would kind of agree with that. So, you know, here you have the, the, the specter of um, your number one general, in effect, threatening to abandon the fight if you do something he doesn't like. Uh, and so McClellan is very popular in the Union Army, remarkably so because he keeps losing battles. <laughs> they still like him. Um, he did have genuine affection for the men, but sometimes that meant that uh, as a battlefield commander, he would not commit uh, enough to actually win the engagements he's in. Uh, here is a cartoon that shows McClellan between Lincoln on one side and Jefferson Davis, the Confederate president, on the other. And uh, McClellan saying the Union must be preserved at all hazards. And then Lincoln is saying no peace without abolition. And Jefferson Davis is saying no peace without separation. So McClellan is going to run for president in 1864 against Lincoln. And uh, um, he makes it clear that his policy basically is making a peace with the South and leaving slavery intact. And uh, so uh, the threat basically is if uh, you don't start winning some victories and turning things around, um, the Union population, the Northern population, may become so demoralized that they'll accept this settlement. Um, one thing working against that, though, is as casualties rise, I think most Northerners, the idea of giving up, you know, once you've lost brothers and husbands and fathers, um, you know, once the casualty rates are high enough, I, I really can't imagine that the North simply would have walked away at that point in time. But there's a real threat, and Lincoln doesn't know. Will McClellan, um, in effect, uh, uh, you know, there were rumors that he might try to seize power, that, you know, basically say Lincoln and the current government are incompetent. Uh, to save the Union, I'm becoming a military dictatorship. I've got an army behind me that loves me. So, uh, actually, a couple of Union commanders during the Civil War make noises about seizing power. Um, the next one is General Joseph Hooker. You know, he made some uh, comment about possible dictatorship, but McClellan's convinced that he's the savior of the United States, even though uh, his battlefield accomplishments don't really back that up. <coughs> so, another problem that, that Lincoln has to worry about is fewer and fewer um, people in the North are signing up to be volunteers. What you see here is they're offering larger and larger cash bounties. It's like, will you serve? We'll give you money. $165 is a lot of money. Uh, and this number keeps going up. Uh, they're married then 366 uh, to sign up and fight. And fewer and fewer people are doing that. Why do you think that is? Why are fewer and fewer people by 1863, 64 volunteering? <laughs> yeah, you, you pick up a newspaper and you, and you page to the New York Times and run a column that ran right down through page one and page two and page three and its names, units, and where you were shot. Like, you know, uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Joe Smith, 5th Massachusetts Infantry, head. And then, you know, the next one, the next one. And then, uh, not only people read about it in the newspaper, the train pulls into the station and you're going to town. And here's maybe someone you went to school with. He's a year or two older than you. And you were thinking about volunteering. He gets off the train. He's missing his leg mm -hmm. from here down. Or worse than that, uh, uh, they begin developing prosthetic uh, devices in the Civil War because people have their jaws shot off. Or part of their face is gone. Their nose is gone. You just have a hole in the middle of your face. And small children scream and run away when they see you. You, know, you can't come out in public. And so um, the more that people see the real cost of the Civil War, in human terms, the fewer people are going to agree to go and fight. And they find out from their older brothers or friends from back home that, you know, that much of the war involves eating really bad food and sickness from disease. Some units lose more men from you know, you know, cholera than they do from enemy bullets. And so the, the glamour of the Civil War is worn off. And so Lincoln has to worry if an unknown number of Northerners are pro-slavery or at least don't want emancipation, that uh, this could hurt recruitment. Just at the time, you're, we're, we're, we're maybe about to lose the war, and I, I need replacements, and this political move, policy move, could actually undo the war effort. On the other hand, though, ah, uh, I've got these in reverse. Battle of Antietam in Maryland. This is the first invasion of the North by Robert Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. 
It's kind of a half northern victory, you might say. Um, uh, uh, McClellan has a lot larger army than Lee does, but he's afraid to use it. Uh, McClellan's not up at the front commanding where he should be. He's back in the rear getting you know, messages from his officers. And many people describe the, the Battle of Antietam as three separate engagements fought side by side that are not coordinated. And so McClellan starts by attacking on the right, then he sends in troops on the center, and then later in the afternoon he attacks on the left. And Lee is able to move the same men <laughs> to face all of these threats. In other words, we just attacked with everything. The, the Confederates sort of crumpled. Uh, Lee only had at the beginning of, of Antietam only like 30 some thousand men. McClellan has about 100,000. So this is a case of where a much smaller Confederate army holds its own uh, after the first day's fighting. The, the Southerners have successfully repelled all of these advances, but they're holding on by their teeth. And they've suffered nearly a third of their numbers are casualties, killed or wounded. And the next day, the club refuses to attack. Uh, he had visited the field hospitals, and he's so shocked at the casualties. This is the blood, one of the bloodiest days in American history. There's so many of his men are all shot up, and he just can't order them back into combat the next day. And Lee waits around, like, are they going to attack? I guess not. So the Southern Army retreats intact back south again. So um, Lincoln is livid. He thought that this was our chance to win the war. You've got the enemy with the, with the Potomac River to his back. There's nowhere to run, and you let him get away. But Clellan, of course, thinks he saved the Union. Uh, but uh, he then refuses to move for weeks, and ultimately Lincoln fires him. He's like, you know, it, you know he, he makes comments like, you know, uh, if, you, if you don't want to use the army, I'd like to borrow it. And then eventually it's, it's done. Um, the Battle of Antietam, though, uh, is finally something you could say is a victory. Uh, Lee's men are compelled to f cross back over the Potomac into Virginia. And, uh, you know, for a while, the North is safe from invasion. Washington, D.C. is saved. Um, and this is the cover with which Lincoln then can issue the Emancipation Proclamation. I, I talk about manpower. Um, there's the other side of the equation, which is African Americans. And Frederick Douglass and other black leaders have been telling Lincoln, you've got all of these people who want to fight, and they're available, and, and uh, you don't have to pay them a, a big bonus or, or a big reward, they're ready to sign up. And so ultimately, you have 163 black regiments, 180,000 soldiers, African Americans fight for the Union cause, and that doesn't include all the Navy. You already had African Americans in the Navy, that was always an important component uh, of service at sea. Uh, a lot of people look at this and they say, at this time in the Civil War, without African American soldiers, you know, that they're critical for Union victory, that, uh, um, that certainly uh, this was the right decision to make strategically for the North to win the war. The other thing is, is that uh, after the Emancipation Proclamation is issued, um, there isn't mass desertions in the Union armies. People stay, they might grumble about it, there was complaining, but white soldiers did not abandon the cause. So those fears and McClellan's predictions turn out to be wrong. And so, um, but there was no way for Lincoln to really know this. So that's where I think you really have to respect Lincoln as president. He's someone who um, really goes out, uh, takes big risks with a lot at stake. He follows kind of his instincts, I think he tries to read the evidence, but then, when necessary, you, you make a plunge into the unknown. Um, and in this case, it, it pays off. Um, uh, Union armies don't dissolve, and African American troops flow in. Uh, eventually, you have Robert E. Lee, um, the Southern commander, begging Jefferson Davis and the government in Richmond to arm black troops for the South. Uh, ironically, at the be beginning of the war, you had black troops in Louisiana, many of them are Creoles, who uh, wanted to serve in the Louisiana Armed Forces to fight for their state, and they returned down. Most of those men ultimately fought in blue uniform. And so at the end of the war, we're really with the, the Confederacy wrecked, Jefferson Davis finally uh, approved of black troops to fight for the South, but by then the war was over with. Um, it did no good. <coughs> then the question, was it legal or not? Um, as a commander-in-chief in an emergency situation, Lincoln uh, contended that he had the right um, to, to, to emancipate slaves. Um, the question was is that once the war is over with, um, do you have the right to take away property in wartime emergency and then permanently uh, remove it from its, uh, the owners, basically? That was the question. And what about loyalists, people who weren't in rebellion against the North but owned slaves, but maybe who live in the South? Um, so there, there are these problems that I think Lincoln wrestles with, is 
um, you know, is this just a word time measure? And will then, you know, once the war is over with, will according to the law, slaves have to be returned to uh, servitude? Um, basically, uh, um, uh, I think you make a good argument that uh, slaves in the South, regardless of whether it's unionists who own them or pro-Confederate uh, slave owners, that, that basically um, there's a variety of circumstances which the government legally can take away property uh, for the good of society. And one example would be like eminent domain. You know, I own property, but we have to build the interstate highway system, and they're going to they're going to seize my property. They might compensate me for it at supposedly fair market value, but uh, that that kind of thing happens um, during the war. Uh, the Confederate government is conscript, conscripting slaves to work for Southern armies to perform labor. So it's, it's clear that uh, uh, the other side is certainly using s slaves, whether their masters like it or not. So I think under the circumstances. Uh, certainly during the war, it makes sense as a war measure, and Lincoln always backs up by saying this is, this is a military measure, I'm doing this as commander-in-chief uh, to advance the cause of the war. I think you can make a good argument that uh, that was sound reasoning. Uh, however, um, uh, Congress backs up the Emancipation Proclamation with the 13th Amendment. Um, so they, they, they close the case so that there, there's not going to be any wiggle room afterwards. And that's when you have Andrew Johnson as president, who wants to go the other way. Johnson wants basically to uh, return everything to the way it was before the war, uh, status quo ante, and, and basically put people back into slavery. <coughs> so, civil rights legacy. Um, uh, I think that obviously emancipation is part of the progression that leads us toward the civil rights movement and toward the goal of racial equality. Um, by itself, obviously, uh, um, there's, there's other factors involved in getting us uh, moving forward. And the amendments 13, 14, and 15 to make African American citizens, give them the right to vote, at least on paper, take another century to make that real. But, uh, um, <coughs> you know, obviously Lincoln is not acting in a vacuum, and you have to kind of credit not just Lincoln's actions, but the, his supporters, the people behind him, all of the people giving him advice, pressuring him and pushing him in the right direction, <clears throat> but uh, um, clearly, I think Lincoln the myth is different than Lincoln the man, and uh, one of the things we could say is, and again, this is similar to the 1960s, I use the, the Lyndon Johnson analogy, I would say, if you fast forward to the Civil Rights Acts of 64 and 65, an important reason that Congress can be compelled to vote yes is the death of John F. Kennedy and his martyrdom, Lincoln's death, <laughs> the blood of the president then, that can be put on the issue of slavery. And, and that gets, I think, the necessary momentum. So it's not just the Emancipation Proclamation, it's the fact that Lincoln dies. He gets assassinated by a white supremacist, by Lee Harvey Oswald, who publicly had said that uh, the reason, you know, in his writings and elsewhere to the public, that you know, Lincoln is killed over the issue of race <laughs> and the fact that Oswald was apparently present during a speech during the second inaugural. And he heard Lincoln talk about voting rights. Good. Not Oswald. Here you go. Oh, thank you. Booth. Yeah. Um, John Wilkes Booth, yeah. It's, it's a long It's a long one. We're with it. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, John Wilkes Booth was a white supremacist. Uh, uh, he leaves his diary behind. It's clear that uh, he takes the action he does over the issue of, of uh, uh, denying African Americans rights. And Lincoln dies at the hands of this person. And so, uh, um, uh, you know, I think it's, it's complicated. Lincoln's, uh, um, Lincoln's credit for advancing civil rights is partly the Emancipation Proclamation, partly uh, his other actions and statements. Um, uh, you know, during the second inaugural, uh, Lincoln talks about the cost of the Civil War and, uh, and kind of the divine judgment that for every drop of blood shed by the lash, we're going to have to shed another drop on the battlefield. So Lincoln recognizes the magnitude of what he's doing, but uh, he's not a saint. He's a politician and a lawyer, and uh, he has to kind of balance all that out. Uh, and, and the times. So I still give Lincoln a lot of credit. I still find him interesting and like him, but he's not, he's not a 20th or 21st century advocate of civil rights. So I think we're down to questions um, or comments. I try to get every logo associated with this event. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want people to go after you. Um, 
Um, <laughs> Come on. Throw something at you. I, I thought it was fantastic that you said something about the blacks uh, being in all the uh, wars. A lot of people. Even in this area, they didn't realize that. The, the irony of that, of course, is that yeah, it was the 20th century, and uh, you know, during the Second World War, you have debates about, you know, will the African Americans fight? And the same thing during World War One. It's like, you know, look at your history. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, Native Americans uh, or African Americans fight in uh, all the wars up through the Civil War. They also fight in the Spanish American War. They fight in Indian Wars, the Buffalo Soldiers, World War One, World War Two, Korea. So, uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, that's true, and it, you know, it's kind of exasperating how people can debate those things yeah. um, when uh, you forget certain things. How was the proclamation received in Kansas? Well, Kansas is split. Officially, Kansas, you know, the, the, the government that prevails here is the free soil, it's a free soil yeah. folks. I think many of the most uh, determined pro-slavery people are already voted down the state, many of them. They're probably fighting for Quantrell or whatever, yeah. you know. So um, probably well in places like Lawrence, but maybe less well in, in other parts of the state. If you get out and have to look at settlement patterns, you can almost predict probably. Kansas is, is, is a complicated place. And so, uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I would say that you know, probably maybe areas of Kansas that were settled by certainly Southerners or people, you know, maybe from the border states. Those places probably were less enthusiastic. Yeah, but. it's it's just it's, it's a very interesting contrast for me because my hometown in Connecticut was a foundry town and a mill town at the time, and and uh, a stop on the Underground Railroad, and when the the proclamation came out, all the church bells got rung and all the cannons got fired off, and at the 150th anniversary they had a new bell cast mm. to you know, right. remember that. But it's also, it's a foundry town. They were selling the arms sure. that were going to the battlefields. Yay, we're fighting. But less than, <laughs> less than 100 miles away in New York City, exactly. um, you have the Irish rioting yes. um, against, you know, and, and in terms of a race riot, yes. and they burn a black orphanage. Yes. And, and so, uh, yeah, you know, um, uh, then again, you know, you have pockets of, of anti-unionist sympathy in the north. You know, in the south, you've got large pockets of pro-unionist territory down south. And so the country is a, is, is a mess uh, in that period anyway. And uh, um, then you have the regions that are on either side, so like in the Ozarks, where they're not really friendly toward the, the, the Union or the Confederacy in some of those counties. Yeah. But, but I was going to speak up because uh, in the military town, uh, Walter Robinson's big change. Just since I was a little kid, you know, 63, I remember seeing an 8-year-old kid, uh, I guess that's why it's like in that way, because I'm that Maltese color. You know? uh, uh, he's sitting there crying while he was, he's, he's, this is the first grader, you know, he's watching Kennedy on TV, and he's just all broke up about it, because he's waiting for mom to come and pick him up at the... You meant the assassination. Right, the assassination yeah. of Kennedy, so it's just something I like to inject there. It's, it's always kept me uh, non-racial as much as possible. Um, for Kansas, though, what part of Kansas? <laughs> well, that's. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how much was as settled. How how. Western Kansas almost, uh, you know. Like today.